One of the things that people who love The Last Jedi like to bring up are the themes that can be found in the movie, and how many of them there are. In my quest for new and perhaps better or more positive perspectives on the sequel trilogy, I thought it might be good to think about and actually consider these themes. So I did, and today we're going to take a look at one of the more prominent topics that can be found in the movie, failure. To be clear, failure isn't a theme, failure is a topic. What the movie says about that topic is where we find the theme. In The Last Jedi, this is enunciated by Yoda when he finally shows up to talk some sense into Luke. The greatest teacher failure is. Almost every main character in this movie has some sort of arc, and woven into the fabric of their journeys are failures that they should learn from in order to complete those journeys. Every character in this movie fails at some point. Finn fails to escape the Radis. He and Rose fail to find the Codebreaker. They do find a Codebreaker, but they still fail to shut down the Tracker. Rey fails to get Luke to help the Resistance or to train her in any meaningful way, and she fails to get Kylo to come back to the light. Poe fails to follow orders and people die. He fails to trust Holdo, fails in his mission with Rose and Finn, and fails with his mutiny, and people die. He fails to destroy the battering ram cannon on Crate, and as usual, people die. Luke fails to help the Resistance or to train Rey. He failed to restore the Jedi Order. He failed Kylo by trying to kill him, and failed to keep his nephew from going to the dark side. Leia failed to get Poe, and everyone else, to follow her orders and failed to summon her allies to rescue them on Crate. Kylo failed to turn Rey to the dark side, he failed to kill Luke, and he failed to finish off the Resistance. There is a lot of failure in this movie that our characters can learn from. Finn needs to learn to commit to a cause, to something bigger than himself. Poe needs to learn to see the big picture, to learn that the big heroic action isn't always the answer before he can become a leader. Rey needs to learn to step up and stop looking for others to be the solution, as she does first with Luke and then with Kylo. Luke needs to learn that the galaxy does need him to be a legend and to not give up just because he failed. So that is the big picture look at the topic of failure and the movie's theme that failure is the best teacher. That is one of the things that the movie is trying to say, and how it says it. The problem is that when we look closer, it doesn't say it very well, and that has everything to do with how our characters fail. We begin the movie with the dreadnought attack on Dakar. Poe fails to obey Leia's orders to return to the Radis, and this puts the fleet at risk. His attack succeeds, but it's actually a failure because all the bombers are destroyed. Here's the problem, though. The characters tell us that it's a failure, but the movie shows us that it's not. The movie raised the stakes of this scene by having the Dreadnought shift its guns to target the Radis. We're shown the massive power of these guns with the fireball of its previous shot visible from space. Combined with Poe's statement that the Dreadnought is a fleet killer, the implication is that the Dreadnought can, and is about to, destroy the Radis, Leia, and the Resistance. This means that if Poe hadn't pressed on with the attack, when the First Order catches up with the Resistance in deep space, this same risk would exist, and the Dreadnought would kill them. So when the First Order tracks them through hyperspace, Poe's failure becomes a success, showing him that he made the right call, and it's not a failure he can learn from. The alternative is that we're being misled, that the Dreadnought isn't that powerful, and that Leia and the Radis are not in as much danger as we are being led to believe. If that's true, then Poe got all these people killed for nothing, which makes him an unsympathetic character. A mistake like that usually requires some atonement, which typically involves the character's death. Meanwhile, in the Unknown Regions, Rey is failing to keep Luke from throwing his father's lightsaber away and failing to convince him that he should return to aid the Resistance. After Luke's refusal, she follows him around the island for a bit until something draws her to the ancient Jedi Temple. Luke confronts Rey and asks who she is and why is she really here. When Rey explains her recent awakening with the Force and asks for help, Luke again refuses with no explanation beyond his parting words that it's time for the Jedi to end. This is where we run into the first problem with Rey and Luke's failure on Octo. She asked him to help the Resistance, and he said no. She asked him to teach her, and he said no. Where is her story supposed to go from here? There's no way forward, so this plotline has hit a dead end. This is Harry, Ron, and Hermione camping in the Deathly Hallows. They found a Horcrux, but they don't know how to destroy it, and when they finally do figure out how to do this, they don't have the necessary item to complete the task. So, the movie just dies and meanders for about 20 or 30 minutes until a third party intervenes and solves the problem for them. This same thing happens to the Avengers in the Age of Ultron when they retreat to the farm until Fury shows up. Now thankfully, Johnson has other storylines that we can jump to so he doesn't let the movie just lay there. Instead, we go to the other movie happening on the Radis. Poe gets slapped and the First Order shows up, but when we return to Octo, Luke is on the Falcon and it's R2, the third party, that intervenes and tells Luke to get off his ass and train Rey. Watch the language. This dead-end kind of failure exists in all of the storylines of The Last Jedi, where our heroes have been written into a corner, and there's nothing they can do to progress the story other than wait for a third party to step in. I submit to you that the better way for our characters to fail is when they don't accomplish their goals, there are still options available for them to pursue, or a way for them to refocus their efforts to try again. Maybe taking what they've learned from their earlier failure and using that to their advantage. There's another reason to do this, though. If we know there's no way forward if our heroes fail, then it becomes less likely that they will fail. 
Let's jump ahead to the speeder attack on Crate. The situation as presented to us is that there's only one way in or out of this base, and the only thing holding the First Order back is an armored door. Our only hope at this point is to hold out long enough for Leia's allies in the Outer Rim to show up. We must destroy the Battering Ram Cannon or we're going to die. That in mind, what remains of the Resistance goes outside and is annihilated before Poe decides that this is pointless and retreats. But as we've already established, there's no other way for them to go, and so once again, we require the intervention of a third party to solve this problem. Side note, the Resistance goes out to stop the First Order from blowing open the door and killing them, but 90% of the Resistance that made it to Crate is killed in this defense before the First Order even fires their big gun. Just something to think about. Anyways, if there were still options available or a way to refocus our efforts, we wouldn't need a third party intervention, but that leads to another problem with the way that our heroes fail in this movie. Making an effort, or, put another way, how hard did they really try? How hard did Rey actually try to get Luke's help? He says no, and she camps outside his door until R2 sets him straight. She doesn't give up, but she's not actively trying to solve this problem. How hard did she really try to get Kylo to switch sides? She kind of just delivers herself to the headquarters of the First Order and expects that somehow to be enough? Rose and Finn get locked up, and they just sit in jail until Benicio breaks them out. Where is the effort? We don't love characters because they succeed or because they win. We love characters because they try, because they struggle and earn that win, because they make an effort and do their best to accomplish their goals, and sometimes their best isn't enough. If a character does their best and still fails, we admire them for that. There's nothing admirable about failing because you phoned it in, but what could be worse than that is failure due to incompetence. The second major plotline of The Last Jedi is the Great Space Chase. This is another situation where the characters don't fail in the right way. When I made my earlier video about Poe's arc and I was thinking about his conflict with Holdo, I had a hard time trying to figure out what his lesson is supposed to be here. His arc is about learning to become a leader, but where Holdo is concerned, the only thing that he can learn from her about being a leader is how not to do it. Holdo is a new commander to the Raddus, and it's imperative that she immediately establishes an atmosphere of confidence, respect, and trust. The way to not do that is to chastise and belittle one of your officers in public, no matter how much he deserves it. We can see right away that she fails to establish this atmosphere of trust because Poe is able to enlist the aid of Connix in helping Finn and Rose escape, and later with even more of the crew when he leads a mutiny. In my other video, I also talked about Commander's Intent, which comes from the Army Doctrine of Mission Command. Basically, the commander should make it known to everybody how they intend to succeed in their mission, in this case, escaping to Crate. That way, if something happens and her subordinates aren't able to reach her, they can make rapid decisions based on what they know about what she wants. Subordinates making decisions based on commander's intent is called disciplined initiative. The only good reason for the commander not to share the plan is if they were concerned about a spy, and this is not a concern that is presented in the movie. Nor is it something that can be inferred, because if it was, that should be the conflict we're dealing with. The point of all of this is to say that Poe and Holdo's failure stems from incompetence, and audiences will usually reject characters that fail in this way. Now, I should be clear that failure due to incompetence would have been okay except for two big reasons. First, this conflict doesn't test Poe's flaw correctly in that it isn't a conflict that's unique to him. In Jill Chamberlain's book, The Nutshell Technique, she talks about the difference between a story and a situation. A story is unique to a character. A situation can work with any character. If we can substitute another character for Poe in this plot and with some minor adjustments have it still work, then it's not unique to his character because it doesn't test his specific flaw, and it's a situation, not a story. For example, if we put Finn in Poe's place, how different would this plot line be? Remember, this whole plan about disabling the tracker is Rose and Finn's idea, not Poe's, because they don't know the plan either. And as I said earlier, right at the beginning of this conflict, Poe is able to recruit Connix, a bridge officer, to help him because Holdo is that bad as a leader. Which brings us to the second problem. The whole movie, we've been led to believe that Holdo is not to be trusted, and we've been shown that she's a bad leader due to her incompetence. That would be okay if the movie wanted her character to be unsympathetic, but redeem her failure as a leader with her sacrifice in the Holdo maneuver. But that's not what the movie tells us. She actually wasn't a traitor. She did have a plan, and all of this is Poe's fault. If that's true, then half of the resistance dying in the escape to Crate is on Poe, which makes him an unsympathetic character. A mistake like that usually requires atonement, which typically involves the character's death. I found an article by screenwriter Brian Young on his idea of the theme of The Last Jedi, which he said was interpretation from point of view. He says, Poe and the audience discover the audacity and wisdom in Holdo's plan at the same time and force us to feel the same foolish sheepishness that Poe does and the same heartbreak when his actions lead to Holdo being forced to sacrifice herself for the survival of the Resistance. So that is a good description of how we're supposed to feel, but that was absolutely not my experience in this movie. I have several distinct memories from when I first saw these movies in the theater, and the reveal of Holdo's plan is one of them. 
Instead of feeling sheepish for not trusting her, I'm sitting there in the theater doing my best impersonation of Jackie Chan, thinking, well, why didn't she just tell him? I had rejected the character, and therefore a good chunk of the movie, because this failure was due to incompetence. Johnson wanted to explore the idea of a conflict among the good guys, which could have been interesting, but there's nothing compelling about this conflict because it could have and should have been easily avoided if Holdo was the competent heroic leader that the movie wants us to think that she is. Speaking of incompetence, let's go back to Canto Bight and look at one of the many reasons why people generally don't like this sequence. First, Rose and Finn parked our shuttle on a public beach, which Joseph Gordon-Levitt tells them they can't do. This is what leads to them getting arrested in the casino and being hauled off to jail. This is failure due to incompetence. Side note, I want to point out something that has always bothered me about this part of the movie. This is a casino filled with the evil rich of the galaxy. Look at how they are dressed, and then look at Finn and Rose. How do the two of them even make it through the door? Just something to think about. Moving on, Rose and Finn get locked up, where they proceed to do nothing about fixing their situation and have to be rescued by Deus Ex Codebreaker, DJ. Now, coincidences can and do happen in stories, but they're less noticeable the earlier they happen and they're more effective when they lead to complications and not solutions. Complications lead to more conflict and obstacles for our heroes, whereas solutions conveniently remove them and run the risk of feeling like deus ex machina moments. This is Pixar rule of storytelling number 19. Coincidences to get characters into trouble are great. Coincidences to get them out of it are cheating. Now, DJ being able to hack open the cell is fine, because this is his character introduction where he establishes what he can do. However, him being the exact kind of person they're looking for, who just happens to be locked up in the cell with them, is the convenient third-party intervention they need to get out of their incompetent, dead-end failure which they are making no effort to solve on their own. Having escaped Canto Bite with a codebreaker, Finn and Rose sneak onto the Supremacy, where they are immediately spotted by an evil BB-8 and captured the moment they step into the server room. Now, I did say that coincidences should lead to complications, but in this case, it doesn't lead to an obstacle that our characters have to work hard to overcome. They just immediately fail. And that makes it feel like our characters failed because the plot needed them to, and not because the bad guys outsmarted them or overpowered them. It's just bad luck. What would be less of a coincidence is if Finn, the guy that used to mop the floor here, was recognized by someone he used to work with. Remember, two days ago, he was still in the First Order. But the real problem with this part of the subplot is that our heroes finally get in the room with the tracker, and that's as close as they get. So now, they're only here as a plot device so that DJ could tell the First Order to look for the transports, which makes this whole subplot feel like a waste of time. Our heroes didn't really get a chance to try their best, they just got unlucky and failed. I'm not sure what can be learned from that. Maybe don't hide BB-8 with a trash can. Side note, BB-8 hiding in a trash can is what leads to their capture and failure, but BB-8 being in the same trash can allows him to avoid being captured with the others and to rescue them later. Just something to think about. So now it's finally time to talk about Luke Skywalker and his failure with Kylo. A while back, I was reading through an argument about Luke's portrayal in The Last Jedi, and one individual who didn't like it said that Luke's failure wasn't compelling. And my first thought was, yeah, it wasn't compelling, right before my second thought, which was, wait a minute, what does that really mean? This is one of those big words that make you sound correct, but which I feel doesn't adequately explain what the problem is. Something compelling in this context would mean that it demands attention or is convincing, and I don't feel that either of those apply to Luke's failure. As we've already been over, we love characters whether they win or lose, if they try their best and make an effort. Luke does his best in the attack on the Death Star, so we love him when he wins. He doesn't give up on his friends and tries his best to defeat Darth Vader, so we love him when he loses. Now it's revealed that he failed to keep Kylo from turning to the dark side, but did he try his best? Did he make an effort? I don't really think so. After sensing the darkness in Kylo, does Luke resolve himself not to let his nephew fall to the dark side? No, he pulls out his lightsaber and thinks about killing him. I wouldn't really describe that as his best effort, but before we continue, we should look at the other way that we're okay with our heroes failing, which is actually what's happening to Luke here. Failing due to a flaw. Good transformative stories have heroes that not only pursue an outer visible goal, but also have some internal struggle or flaw that they need to overcome in order to complete that goal. Luke can't destroy the Death Star, and Rey can't beat Kylo in the woods until each of them accepts the Force. As internal struggles go, that's not really much, but that is what they both need to resolve in order to win. If they fail to resolve this inner struggle, they give in to their flaw, and they lose. Obi-Wan and Yoda want Luke to be patient and warn him that he's not ready to face Vader. Luke doesn't listen to them, and he loses. In this movie, Luke's fear of Kylo's future causes him to momentarily consider killing Kylo, which is the same reaction that we saw from him when Vader threatened Leia in Return of the Jedi. So Luke didn't do his best here, and he gave in to his flaw. This isn't admirable the way it would be if he had done his best, but it is relatable, which makes it an acceptable way for our heroes to fail. Except for one very important thing. We've already seen him do this. 
We've already seen him give in to this flaw. We've seen him recognize that it wasn't the right thing to do, and we've seen him learn from that. That's how character development happens. If they've learned from their previous mistakes, they shouldn't make that mistake again. That would undo their previous development, and audiences generally don't like that, because what was the point of going through all of that if nothing changed? Now, in the many discussions that I've had about this with people who feel differently, I've only heard two arguments against this point of view that I think actually have some merit. The first argument is that how Luke reacts here, and how Luke reacts here, is not the same, because in Return of the Jedi, there's nothing he can do for his friends outside, so he's acting out of anger with the goal of revenge, whereas in The Last Jedi, he's acting out of fear with the goal of protection or prevention. I would agree that Luke is giving in to his anger or revenge when he tries to strike down Palpatine, but he recovers from that. It's not until Vader says that if Luke won't turn, then maybe Leia will, that Luke gives in to his fear and turns to the dark side, giving him the strength to beat Vader. To me, that seems closer to the fear that Luke shows in The Last Jedi. But even if we were to say that these are not the same thing, this still suffers from the same problem as the next argument, which is that Luke did learn from his earlier experience. This time, when he gives in to his fear, he almost immediately recognizes that this is the wrong thing to do. Now, I believe that him learning from his earlier experience should mean that he would know that's the wrong thing to do before he does it, but if we were to accept that, this still isn't compelling, and here's why. The different perspectives of Kylo's fall started with Luke's first version of events, where he went to confront Kylo, but it was already too late and Kylo attacked him. Then we got Kylo's version, where Luke had sensed his power and came to kill him. Finally, we got the truth from Luke that he was afraid of Kylo and almost killed him, but decided not to. So Kylo's version of this is actually not that far from the truth, but what this boils down to is a simple misunderstanding. To me, this is about as compelling as the third act misunderstanding from a romantic comedy, which is to say, it's not. The reason this kind of misunderstanding happens in a romantic comedy is that we need the characters to break up for the third act conflict, but we need both of the characters to remain sympathetic. And that's kind of the objective here. It makes Kylo a more sympathetic character. It's not his fault he fell to the dark side, joined a genocidal organization, and executed a village full of people in the first scene that we met him. He thought Luke was trying to kill him. What else was he supposed to do? The problem I have with that is that this is done to the detriment of Luke's character, who shouldn't have made this mistake in the first place. Not only that, but then he responds to this failure in a way that is unlike the character we used to know, by giving up on Kylo, the Jedi, and the galaxy, and retreating to his island to die. Something that I see brought up a lot in response to this is that allegedly this is the kind of Luke that George Lucas had in mind for his episode 8. I don't immediately see that as a problem, and let me try to paint a picture for you. Let's say that Luke had seen the darkness rising in Kylo, and even the potential future destruction that Kylo might bring, and then said, I'm Luke Skywalker, a legend. If I can save Vader, I can save this kid too. Then he does his best to save his nephew, and fails. Now that is the kind of failure that might give someone as optimistic as Luke an existential crisis, making him retreat to his island of solitude and self-doubt. The point I'm trying to make here is that you could make a version of Luke a lot like he is in the actual movie, but how you get Luke to that point makes all the difference, and how he gets there in The Last Jedi is not the right way. The last thing I want to talk about before we wrap up today is Yoda's pep talk that gets Luke back into the game. Yet again, another third-party intervention that kind of begs the question, why didn't Yoda come to do this earlier? Just like the movie, we're not going to think about this question, so instead we're going to focus on Yoda's message for Luke. It's here where the theme of failure being the best teacher is enunciated by Yoda, and where he shows Luke that the galaxy does need him to be a legend. But Yoda also tells Luke that he needs to pass on what he's learned, not just strength and mastery, but weakness, folly, and failure, before closing with a really great line, We are what they grow beyond. That is the burden of all masters. I had to think about this for quite a while before it came to me what the issue with this scene is. This scene feels like something I would write. It's got a theme, a message, and a lesson, great lines, beautiful moments, and compelling dialogue. But it feels like this scene was written before the rest of the movie. That's why I said it feels like something I would write. I have ideas for scenes all the time, and maybe some good lines to put in them, but you have to create a story where those scenes will fit, and here, I'm not sure that it does. Because Luke didn't teach her anything. Nor is he going to. He's going to be the legend that the galaxy needs, to be the spark that inspires people to stand up against the First Order, but he's going to die without training Rey. He hasn't taught her anything. He only gave her two lessons. The first one was essentially the Obi-Wan lesson about accessing the Force, but she already got that in the last movie from Maz. The second lesson was a skewed view of history, and the first version of his failure with Kylo. Neither of these lessons are really going to help her with the Force. This is actually the source of one of the jokes in the Lego Holiday special that made me genuinely laugh out loud. When farm boy Luke explains Yoda's lesson for Rey, and she says, Luke, thank you. For what? For teaching me something. So that is the theme of failure being the best teacher as presented by The Last Jedi. 
You can see this theme at work all over this movie, but I don't think it's executed very well, because in almost every situation, our characters are not failing in the right way. We have failures where our heroes don't really make an effort, failures due to incompetence, failures due to bad luck or because the plot requires it, and failures due to flaws that have previously been overcome. Lastly, almost every storyline in this movie results in a dead-end failure where our heroes are unable to proceed without the intervention of a third party. Maybe that's actually the theme of this movie. If you can't solve your problems, wait for someone else to solve it for you. In that regard, The Last Jedi is one of the most thematically consistent movies I've ever seen. Rey can't progress with Luke until R2 chews him out. There's nothing for Poe to do except yell at Holdo until Finn and Rose get back. Finn and Rose are stuck in jail until they discover they're sharing a cell with a conveniently placed codebreaker. After abandoning the speeder attack on Crate, there's nothing that our heroes can do except wait to die until Luke Skywalker shows up to save the day. Finally, Poe leads the last of the Resistance to a literal dead end and has to be saved by Rey using the Force in a more impressive way than we've ever seen, even though she knows almost nothing more about it than she did at the beginning of this movie. So that is why I think the theme of failure being the best teacher doesn't really work that well within this movie. But from a meta point of view, there's a lot to be learned from The Last Jedi and why I think it's a failure. So maybe it actually is true to its theme. Hmm, something to think about. If you disagree with anything I said here today, feel free to tell me what and why. And if you liked or hated today's video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up or a thumbs down. But that's all I got for you today. I thank you very much for watching. I hope to see you next time and may the Force be with you, always.